Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tunnel Vision, a show brought to you by uscfootball.com. I'm your host, Ryan Abraham. You can follow me on Twitter at Inside Troy or X or whatever you want to call it. And uh, I'm joined in studio all the way from the East Coast. We got Mr. Shotgun Spratling himself. He's here dressed uh, dapperly. He just, he just always looks good, and uh, <laughs> but we love him. And Mr. Triple Double himself, uh, Connor Morissette, is here in studio uh, big news going around the whole USC football, USC athletic department. There's a lot of stuff going on. Shotguns in town. He covered about 15 events before he leaves <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, and then with a bunch of unexpected, uh, major recruits recommitted today. Um, there was the Under Armour camp spring practice, USC women's you know, basketball team made it to the, uh, round of 32 and they're hosting Kansas, uh, tomorrow at the Galen center to go to the sweet 16. Lots of stuff going on, so we got to do a show, and uh, I don't know how long it's going to take. It might take a little while, but uh, we got to go. There's a lot of stuff we got to go over. But first of all, welcome you guys in. How are you guys doing? We're we're surviving. Uh, we were both out uh, <laughs> at the Under Armour camp today in Mission Viejo. A lot of wind, a lot of sun for both of us. So yes. Connor nearly passed out earlier. My <laughs> eyes, I don't think, want to stay open uh, just from all the wind that we endured, and then. I tried to make it up to the USC UCLA baseball game and made it for about an inning, and then the rains came, and uh, I had to get back down here to the studio. So didn't get to see the end of it. Unfortunately for USC, they did not win the series today. They I, did not. Oh, I had to sit in the shade today for about 15 minutes, take some time out of the sun, even though it wasn't that hot. But the sun down there at Mission Viejo High School was getting to me. Uh, but yeah, survived. Here we are, and let's talk about some of these recruiting wins. I feel like we got to start there. You want to start? We could start with the recruits. Um, I mean, th so that was sort of like the unexpected uh, surprise. And if you're uh, if you're watching uh, live on YouTube or Facebook or um, Twitter, thank you for doing that. Uh, I have comments for our Facebook users. For some reason, the YouTube ones aren't showing up. I had to kind of like Jerry rig the, the, the my engineering background came into play in the last five minutes before the show. I had to like kind of jerry rig it so we could get the youtube thing going live but i don't think i can get your comments up on the screen but i'll, I'll scan it we can look for questions and stuff if you guys have but i won't be able to uh put your funny ones up on the screen but if you're watching live on facebook um we do have jose uh was live on facebook he says fight on so i can put that one up so if you're on facebook i can put up your comments but not youtube unfortunately um and real quick too i want to let everyone know we still have a 50 percent off sale over at uscfootball.com Make sure you get in there. You want an annual subscription, half off. When you have a day like today where you have to be on the Peristyle, which is our premium message board, that place was going bonkers today. There was so much stuff going on. People excited. Figure out what's going on. Connor, you mentioned it with the recruiting thing. It's USC's kind of been winning the offseason on the coaching side, but they haven't been landing those five-star recruits that everybody covered so much and uh, remembers and – Today was a day where you actually started to get some of those guys flow in. When you, when you start off with five-star Georgia, flip from Georgia, and defensive line, like all that and be in the same sentence, to that kind of started this whole thing going, a lot of USC fans were like, wait, what? We haven't seen something like that for a while. But that was, that was pretty crazy. A massive win. Justice Terry is who Ryan is referring to. And this just all comes back to Eric Henderson. And USC had some other big recruiting wins today. We'll get into all of it. But what time is it this morning? Shotgun, like 3 a.m., 6 a.m. Eastern time, maybe a little bit after that. But very, very early, Justice Terry announced that he's flipped from Georgia to USC. And Steve Wiltfong did an interview on our site with Terry's father. And he talked about Eric Henderson being such a huge part of this recruitment. And they talked about how... Other defensive line coaches never even mentioned the fact that Justice Terry was going to be double teamed and triple teamed. And Eric Henderson, when Justice Terry came to campus, talked about how we're going to get your son out of these double and triple teams and we're going to make sure he's one on one against an offensive lineman to win his battle. And that X is an O talk and a bunch of other stuff. But the father talked about how that X is an O talk ultimately pushed him over the edge and got him to flip from Georgia to USC. It's the kind of guy, like Ryan mentioned, who USC has not been getting the past few years, especially under Lincoln Riley, the offensive genius. Now you have this new defensive staff. We've been talking for months now about how Eric Henderson is going to make a difference. And slowly but surely, we heard some things about recruits being really happy with him and the visits were good. But today, the proof is in the pudding. Justice Terry, a five-star defensive lineman from Georgia, committed to Georgia, flips to USC. USC isn't going to have too many more 
recruiting wins like that to that magnitude. This is one of the biggest wins that they've had in years, and if they can seal the deal and he ultimately signs, what a major, major coup. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you go into Georgia, you take a commit from Georgia. I, I still want to call them the defending national champions. It yeah. still feels raw to call Michigan a national champion. Weird. Um, but, you know, a, a team that there are two national championships back-to-back, you know, that were built on the defensive line and how many draft picks they had over and over. And you just said – you just went in and said, "I know you. You see, they can develop some guys, but we're going to do it better." And that's basically what the pitch was to to Justice Terry: is that we're going to put you in better situations than even Georgia is. Mm-hmm. And Georgia, with all the defensive linemen, I mean, you see, their I won't call him a castaway, but their second tier guy, Barry Alexander, how big of an impact he had at USC when because USC has been lacking so much. So to be able to get someone like that bring them across the country, it is a huge recruiting win. they got to hold them. Yep. USC has had a five-star defensive lineman in recent years from Georgia, and then he decommitted and went to Georgia. Michael Williams, now if the spring portal <laughs> opens up and the rumor mill starts flying around again, USC would not mind uh, you know, stealing back another, uh, stealing back Michael Williams to add to Barry Alexander and then uh, Justice Terry. But, but you know what? That's a good haul. It's a great day. Great day to be able to get one of those. And that's if just you, one guy. What? If you're USC, that's great. Tremendous day if you can flip someone from Georgia, a five-star guy. Or you could just keep going yeah. and continue in Georgia. Well, well, hold on. Well, I want to play this video real quick. The Eric Henderson? That it's uh, the it's like a 44-second video that he put up there, like the yeah. movie thing that made. With, so with Henderson narrating. It's amazing. Yeah, here, I'll play it for <laughs> you guys. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to hear it, but you guys should be able to hear it at home. Here you go. Justice Terry. USC is the factory for defensive linemen with over 91 defensive line draft picks, a prestigious academic education, and the number one media market to utilize your NIL to the fullest potential. This is the place to be. It's not even close. Your technique and the way you play up front from a fundamentally sound and physical at the point of attack, I can't wait to welcome you to this family. It's dog work. Or no work. Let's get it. My name is Jesse Terry. We made it to the University of Southern California. Fight on. Justice. Pretty cool uh, video there. Um, yeah, for Eric Henderson not having worked in college before. Uh, sometimes you have to like. There's a, like a little learning curve as far as recruiting goes. I don't think there's much of a learning curve. For him, and then oh yeah, by the way, we're gonna bring in Aaron Donald this weekend for like recruiting visits. Like maybe that'll help a little bit. Uh, I don't know if that we talked about this before, Connor. About you want to bring him in for just like hanging around for recruiting visits. Seemed to pay pretty big dividends this weekend. Yeah, they they pulled out all the stops uh, this weekend with the recruiting. It was one of their big recruiting weekends. They had a Southern boil. You know, they had crawfish and, and everything and. People the, loved it. The, the, you know, talking with some of the players uh, from the, the quotes we've seen so far and got from uh, some of our 24-7 colleagues, they really enjoyed it. And I think there was one player, I can't remember which one off the top of my head, was like, I would not normally have ordered crawfish. So, I, you know, I would have been like, oh, that, that seems interesting. I'm going to order this other thing. It's very good. But, but they're like, wow, I was kind of, you know, blown away by it. Um, but also we saw leading into it, just seeing, I don't know if you guys noticed, but seeing on, on social media – some of the um, the new recruiting staff that showing the details. So if you have a crawfish boil, you got to have big you know wax paper basically put down to then just wrap everything up, throw away because um, you have a lot of uh, leftover. I mean, not leftover, but uh, shells and shell, everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. a discard stuff. Um, but they had those special made with USC logos and stuff on it. So they didn't just oh, have wow. a blank one there. A lot of times, just like newspaper and stuff. So yes, this is that. and so and. Maybe next time they do newspaper, but it'll be like USC National Championship newspaper or something. like. But, like, the details in it, and that's the things that Annie Hansen and her staff, from the moment they came in, we would hear about, you know, the details of when players would arrive and how how much uh, more intention there was with everything that they did um, as for, from the previous staff as far as there's arrows pointing you in the right direction. The small things like that that – Get, can get overlooked and you get lost or something on your way to an, a, a thing. Um, it, but everything was meticulously planned out. And then you see an event like this where 
you're trying to give all those small things that point out. And now maybe this is what is taking the place of we can't line the beds in the hotel room when someone comes on an official visit with, you know, 50 pieces of mail and the shoe cake and everything else. But so now we'll pivot and do something else. But it's those attention to details that really grab players' attention. Um, it used to be 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was you find out the player's favorite candy and you have a bowl of that candy in their in their uh, hotel room or whatever. And now it's like going to the extremes. And you know, you got to give a lot of credit to Annie Hansen and their staff for doing that. So that's the start. And then you go into, one, the details of the position, talking with Eric Henderson, you know, talking uh, what Justice Harry's dad said. And then you get the wow factor of bringing in Aaron Donald. Not just like it's not a pro bowler or not a, you know, an all-star type of player, not a very good player in the NFL, the best to ever do it. And you just like, oh, yeah, come on down. And he just stops by practice and hanging out and, you know, giving pointers and stuff like that. Like, it's like, how would your eyes not light up? So I wanted to point out before you guys interrupted me, a good day is to flip a five-star from Georgia. You add on to it. I'm not even going to mention all the other ones. But you go into Georgia again and get another top 20 defense alignment. Now, he's only a four-star right now. If he stays 17th in the country, Isaiah Gibson, he will be a five-star. So you get two five-stars from Georgia. And Isaiah Gibson is from Warner Robins. Um, now, I don't know exactly where Manchester, Georgia is. I have to check that. Um, I haven't been there before. But Warner Robins is down the deep south. It's not near Atlanta. This is like three, four hours away from Atlanta. So you, you go on a visit. And Aaron Donald's there, like that's like L.A. can be eye popping and everything, but then Aaron Donald's there, like that's just like mind blowing to you. And that's the type of things um, that USA was able to do. And you know Isaiah Gibson, you could see him yesterday posting about USC and was super excited about how the visit was going. And apparently it went pretty darn well for for USC as well. He enjoyed himself, and they are enjoying the fact that he also committed. Now, you mentioned that Justice Terry, it was in the middle of the night. I, I think the initial tweet it was like 420 i woke up at 458 <laughs> and i'm like scanning through my notification and it's like what it, did i miss this yesterday did this happen like you know and i just missed it because the women's basketball game and everything no this just just popped at 420 in the mo- morning um and usc gets a huge huge news to all the trojan fans when they're waking up uh, especially all those that have been moaning and groaning rightfully so for the last couple months that Julian Lewis is the only one in the class, the only commit they have in the 25 class. And he's actually a 26 commit when they got him. And how are they going to keep him if they can't get anybody else? Well, they got a couple of guys to add to that class. And that's great news since he's supposed to be coming out uh, next week. And great news because two of them are also Georgia boys like him. Yeah. Well, I, see, I was in Vegas. I was just getting in at 4.30 in the morning, whatever, so that I was just catching the news. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was I was definitely in bed for that one. But, yeah, I was up early. I think I saw your tweet, Shotgun. Um, I had to get up early, get on the road to get back here. But, yeah, that was that's a pretty kind of nutty start to the day where, oh, top edge rusher, uh, you know, big, you know, number one defensive lineman from Georgia. Oh, he's coming, you know, so you get that. And then you start seeing more of those fight on emojis and they're flying and I, people are in the chat are saying that there's more that's happening while we're talking. So I don't know, you know, we, we're probably behind as far as like which ones are coming, but <laughs> it was a pretty big week. I mean, there's some other guys out there too. If you, either one of you guys want to chime in on uh, any of them. Uh, the other guys who ended up committing after yeah. the first two. Yeah. So then uh, 2026 defensive back commits Dominic Kelly from Tampa, Florida, and he said they match what I've been searching for, USC, an opportunity to get a world-class education, build lifetime connections and relationships, as well as be developed by one of the best defensive staffs in the country. That seems to be a theme, one of the best defensive staff staffs in the country. And then it got even better in 2025 with Hilton Stubbs, a top 100 safety from Florida, also committing. He was a guy who took a couple of visits this calendar year, and every time he said USC's made me a priority, and that was really important to me. He commits, and... The nightcap, Gus Cordova, a defensive lineman from Texas who comes with a little bit of baggage. I don't know how much we'll get into that on the show, but he commits as well. And his rating was taken off by 247 Sports because he was involved in a bullying incident. But USC's done their homework, it looks like, enough to take his commitment. And 
he's another guy added to the list. I imagine he'll be restored with, with his ranking now that he's committed to USC. So just a, a, a massive, massive day. And, and one thing that I took away today from the Under Armour camp, Shotgun and Ryan, talking to someone who's in the recruiting space who was there yesterday, he said to me, the football practice moved really well. I'm blown away by the defensive staff. It's a kick-ass defensive staff. The recruiting staff did an excellent job. The, the crawfish boil was very professional, and, and that was really good. And just overall, I felt like USC, it's just a little bit different than it has been in the past. And, and, and this guy was really, really impressed, to a guy, like I said, who's been in the recruiting space. So a really, really big day. And we've talked a lot about, okay, you have the staff in place. The recruiting maybe isn't quite there. Now the recruiting's there. Juju Lewis visiting next week. You have all this momentum with him coming to L.A. next week. That's massive. And I got a text today. Someone said Julian Lewis's dad has been really, really impressed with what happened today. So I don't really know how you can't say today has been 10 out of 10. It really can't beat it. I think most people, should, uh, if they're not impressed, it's because yeah. – they work the for receivers? they work for an opposing um, um, organization, opposing program, yeah. or a fan of an opposing program, and do not want to see USC climb their way back because it's a massive day, massive day. Now, yes, there's plenty of work. Uh, you know, if you want to be cynic about it, they had some big days last year. You know, this the, is different though. I think yes, and and that's the the vibe we're getting from everyone is that it's not similar in a similar situation as. Uh, you know, Gerard Martinez is like, he, he said he felt the ghost of uh, Manasseh Atete walking through the hallways. It's like, all right, we'll see if they continue on um, with it. Um, but they, it, take the first step, huge, huge visit weekend, and to turn those into commitments. It's one thing to yep. get a, a some good momentum and get a lot of love out of a, a recruiting weekend like that. It's another thing to actually turn those into verbal commitments. And it is a, a challenge, though. With, I mean, I believe all these kids are, are out of state um, kids. Yep. That is always a challenge when you get that early commitment out of state, just because now everyone is starts pecking at uh, at that commitment. You're gonna go all the way across the country blah, 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 and like start trying to sell you more and more. So sometimes it works better to, you know, have that a silent commit and then pop late. Um, but USC has been very adamant about trying to get those commitments locked in and public. So that you know, they they force the player to like. All right, you're gonna have to have an actual for. You're gonna have to decommit publicly if you you know if you decide to change your mind rather than just being a silent. Like, yeah, okay, coach, I'm coming. You know, some some kids can give silent commitments to three different schools. That happens every. That once happens. In a while. Um, but you know, just a huge weekend for him. A huge day. I mean, it's been 16 hours or so, um, and you know, five commitments, and maybe there's more coming. You know the. The, report, the recruiting staff they obviously have been on social media and have been chirping all over the place, yes. as they should, <laughs> um, because this is a huge, huge day for the future of USC's program. Because, one, it's the, the talented players they got. Talented players want to play with other talented players. Juju Lewis, all the discussion, is he going to decommit? Is he taking these visits? What's going on? He wants to play with a team that can win a national championship. You go out and sit, tell him, look, we're bringing in two five-star defensive linemen. You know the issue we've had? Defensive line. We are addressing that. We are going across the country and addressing our needs and something that USC has struggled to do, and they, they are doing the things they struggle to do. And that's the, that's the big thing. You're addressing your needs, your weaknesses, and that's how you attract a five-star quarterback and keep a five-star quarterback and – then other players follow along. And that's how how uh, a elite recruiting class can build upon itself that way. Yeah, uh, we didn't mention Landon Rink, right? Or Landon Rink came. Uh, he is not committed to USC. Uh, he came. But he was, he on, was a on, visit. on the visit as yeah. well. Another defensive lineman, uh, I believe from Texas, um, and you know a four or five star guy there came away blown away from the visit as well. So you know USC. One, you got you need to be on the peristyle, so you're getting all these updates. Uh, you need to be a member, so you can get you know you can see the quotes yourself. You can see what the players say. Um, but we're been getting some updates from these players, and uh, you know credit to Steve Wolfong, who's been on it while we've been out at the camp. He's been you know working the phones and stuff, and you know it's a it's a great day to be a, a Trojan fan right now because you can feel momentum building, and you can feel things going in the right direction when things have been very stagnant for a good three months um, since, you know, since the end of the season and whatnot. And you can feel, you know, 
we're excited about seeing the gains the players have made, you know, as far as their bodies and stuff. Like, that's okay. That that looks a little different. And so I think there's some excitement there. And now there's a little bit of excitement recruiting. Then you go over to Galen Center and see what the women of Troy are doing. There's excitement <laughs> there. I mean, there's a lot of excitement going on around the campus. Uh, and it was, it was a big weekend. It's going to be an extended weekend. We'll see if there's more commitments to come. There's also a huge basketball game tomorrow. Yeah, which we'll talk about a little bit too. We'll get that. Yeah, there's like March Madness USC style. Uh, very. I mean, it's fun. I mean, not, that's why I was in Vegas. So the first weekend of the tournament is always crazy, but just crazy stuff happening uh, around USC. You guys were both at the Under Armour camp today down in uh, Mission Viejo, with USC having their recruiting event. Um, what was there any crossover with the players? You know, we can. I know Gerard and uh, for those the recruit Knicks out there. Uh, we don't want to get too detailed on the recruiting stuff, but um, Gerard and and uh, Chris will do a composite two star recruits podcast uh, Monday night, so it should be up Tuesday morning. So they'll go through all this kind of detailed stuff. But any sort of high level standouts from you saw down the camp uh, from you know the USC perspective? Marco Jones always stands out to me. The he plays middle linebacker up in Northern California. I think he's at San Ramon Valley, but he projects as a defensive end. He was fantastic, but. Overall, just talking to a lot of the players who were at USC yesterday and, and their takeaways, I just go back to what I said before. USC knocked it out of the park. And I spoke today with Brandon Lockhart, who was USC's, I think, first 2020, maybe not first, but one of the biggest 2026 commits for the Trojans. And there's a rumor Dante Williams goes to Georgia. Brandon's still in touch with Dante. Maybe he'll flip to Georgia. He's still committed to USC. And yesterday was a big step for him to get a chance to talk to Doug Belk and get to know this new USC defensive staff. He said he's still locked in with USC, but he's going to take his time in determining his future. I thought that was interesting because I think a couple weeks ago, it looked like, okay, Brandon Lockhart, this new staff, they're good, but they're probably going to lose him. And it looks like they're making significant strides with him as well. So even people who maybe we thought, uh, I don't know if USC is the school for him, the Trojans are doing a nice job of circling the wagons. And the interest, at least from players on the defensive side of the ball, it's just night and day from what it's been in the past. That, to me was probably the biggest takeaway from today. Yeah, defensive. the defensive staff knocked it out of park just as far as selling themselves, and everyone seems to be on board and impressed with what they can do. Obviously, once the season hits, there has to be results yeah. on the field. <laughs> um, uh, that'll be the biggest thing of, one, holding commits and continue to sell themselves and sell what they can produce right. as, for, as far as um, development of players. So that'll be big. A couple players that stood out to me, Philip Bell, uh, you know, this is my first time seeing him uh, probably in two years. I think I saw him at one of these camps a couple years back, but he was legit. Um, you know, he, he lived up to the status. Uh, his teammate, DJ Lee, definitely has the size. He didn't do any one-on-ones. He kind of shut it down early, but definitely looks uh, legitimate, even though he, I think he eliminated USC just recently uh, as far as his top three or top five. Um, but... Uh, I was a little disappointed in the quarterback play. There wasn't much there. Now, Juju Lewis, you know, USC's commit was not there. But, uh, you know, didn't really stand out there as far as them. Wide receivers, was a little bit hit and miss as well. I think the DB group was probably the best group out there. Um, and then also uh, there were some, some nice linemen as well, some offensive linemen that, you know, since I haven't been out to as many events in, in the last year or so, getting to see some guys and I'm standing with Brendan Huffman or Greg Biggins is like, I don't know who this is, but that guy's good. And that guy's good. And so that's how I'm like finding out about some of the players. Um, that's how I kind of take these events when, when I have it, when I don't have personal relationships with them. So uh, I have to look up a couple of names, but um, a couple of the, the Bishop Gorman players stood out as well on the defensive line. Uh, the MVP was, I'm blanking on his name. You remember his name? Uh, the smaller defensive tackle uh, that, that kind of won pretty much every rep that, that he took. Uh, Prince or Champ? Prince. Prince. Prince what. Okay. Prince, Prince, Prince Williams? Prince Williams, I believe it was. Prince or Champ. That's good. You got that one, right? Um, all right. Well, yeah. So go check out. We have – so there's been so many things going on. If you go over to uscfootball.com, you want to read all about the different players that we saw at the Under Armour camp, you can check that out. And, of course, all the recruiting stories from, uh, you know, the last 24 hours or so has just been absolutely crazy. So make sure you go check it out on the site. The Peristyle, like I mentioned, is going bonkers uh, over there. So go check that out as well. Uh, we wanted to talk about spring football a little bit. Uh, USC's had three spring practices so far. Two of them we were able to attend at least part of it. Uh, Connor and I were there uh, on Tuesday. And then uh, Shotgun was out here on Thursday for that. Uh, and with Connor as well. And, you know, Chris was down there and stuff. 
a uh, bunch of photos. Uh, there's different stories up on the, the site. We got to hear from Lincoln Riley, Miller Moss, Danton Lynn, uh, a lot of stuff going on. I think maybe the one of the bigger storylines was just how much gain there was uh, as far as like physicality of some of these players, uh, some of the new players coming in, how big they looked. Um, some of the players that were returning, you know, significant weight gains there. Um, got to talk to a lot of the players, the coaches and stuff. What did you guys, I don't know whoever wants to start on this one, but just sort of kind of some of your takeaways uh, from what we learned the first couple of days of USC spring football and what we saw and uh, the people we talked to. I can defer to you. Well, you got to go two days, so I was going to defer to you, but I'll, I'll, I'll We always I'll do this. Um, um, <laughs> I think the the thing that stood out to me was one the size you know yeah. seeing some of the players, uh, the, the the it wasn't as evident. You guys talked about it on Tuesday and said, "Man, this guy looks bigger." This guy and you know we always kind of you know guys are always kind of putting on weight uh, a lot, especially we see them at the end of the season. Guys have lost weight during a season that happens. You know you lose weight as you go through the the grind of a season. Um, now sometimes it's five pounds, sometimes it's ten, fifteen, depending on the player, the position, all those different things. How well someone maintains their weight. Um, but you know when they come back, okay, this guy looks like he's had a little bit. He kind of looks a little thicker. You guys talked about it, and I was kind of expecting, okay, I'll see a little bit. It didn't really sink into me. Even the players came by in the tunnel. You know we're taking photos of everybody. It was actually when Braylon Shelby came over to speak to us. He spoke to to the media on Thursday, and I've been down on the field, you know, shooting photos during games uh, last season, and was five feet away from him. Same as this situation, uh, and he looks exactly the same as he did last year. Except last year he was wearing shoulder pads, and now he was not. Like he's added as much weight as p in particular in his, uh, you know, in his shoulders and his upper arms, his chest, that it looks the same size as when he was wearing shoulder pads last year. And I was like, whoa, that's that is really telling. And then, you know, you see guys like Cameron Fountain. I saw him in the fall uh, playing in high school and to see the gains that he's made in the three months. And you see some of the pictures that they, you know, have, have put on Twitter and social media of like uh, uh, Jade Abaziri. You know, gaining, I think it was like 17, 20 pounds, somewhere in there. I um, think 20, a, a lot. And the difference in his body, not just that he gained weight, but that it looks completely different. Like the frame is just, you know, physically in a different shape. Um, so definitely really impressed with the strength and conditioning. When they said this is what they were going to do, Lincoln Riley talked about, we're going to get bigger, we're going to do this. And I kind of go, okay, we'll see. They did it. And so they've backed up that talk, um, at least in that area. So that stood out. And the other thing, since you guys had already kind of talked about that on Tuesday, that was notable to me because I wasn't sure if, I, if it would completely follow through. But the thing from talking to the players was listening to Bryson Shaw talk about how well, how good of a teacher that Danton Lynn is and how well he can explain things that everyone can kind of understand it. And that tells you, when you are installing a defense, that is huge because if you can make it not just one person understand, but you can find a way to communicate with everyone so that everyone is understanding it, your gains in knowledge and retention is just going to be exponential compared to if you're kind of seesawing along uh, with some guys getting it, some guys not, and you know, you're not getting a consistent flow of, of information and communication and knowledge uh, of the defense. So I, I think that that uh, is a ter tremendous step for this defense to potentially take a big uh, leap forward from where it was last year. Without saying him by name, Alex Grinch was sort of the fall guy, I think, for, for last season's failures based on what we heard this week. Lincoln Riley talking about defensively we're having a philosophically different approach this year. And Benny Wiley, the strength coach, just does what the coaches say. So now we're asking the guys to get bigger. Don't look at Benny Wiley for what happened <laughs> last year. And then Jamil Muhammad saying we weren't big enough last year, and everyone knew it. It was the elephant in the room. The coaches knew it. The players knew it. Well, who's no longer here? It's the defensive coordinator from last season. So that stuck out to me. I think we talk a lot about perception on this show, Ryan, the, the perception of USC. And yeah. Lincoln Riley is going out of his way to, to talk about our defense is going to be better. We're going to be bigger. Last year, 
he's not saying was a failure, but everything he's saying about changing from last year it make, makes you think that he feels that way, and it's clear they, they weren't good enough last season. So it's just a totally new approach into what Shotgun said. The guys definitely look a lot bigger, and they're doing a lot of things the exact opposite of what they were doing a year ago, and I think that should lead to different results, which is going to be huge. Michael in the chat on YouTube, and again, sorry, I can't, uh, if you're watching, I can't put the YouTube comments up uh, today. I can do the Facebook ones, but I, we can read some of them. He says, I don't want to hear any more offseason gains talk. We hear this every year. <laughs> That's true. And every year we are underwhelming in the trenches. Well, just saying, like, just for what Shotgun said, I mean, I'll put, if you're watching on, if you're watching the Braid, like the Braylon Shelby, I mean, he just looks different. You look at him and it's like, okay, that's a different looking kind of cat than he was before. So it's not talk. It's like, we're actually seeing it going, holy crap, those guys look bigger. I, I guess the thing I have is the head coach is the same. The strength and conditioning coach is the same. Was the defensive coordinator really limiting like how big guys could be? Like, is that where we're, we're at here? And now they're like, screw it. Just everyone, let's get bigger. Well, it was, like Lincoln Riley says, it was a philosophical difference. I mean, you were doing the defense of approach last season was the speed D. It was we're going to beat the blockers to the point of attack and then be able to create havoc by beating them to the spot. And that's all about quickness and speed. It's that first step off the ball, and it is an approach that can work. We've seen it work at places. It did not work with the roster that USC had last year. And whether they didn't get quicker or whatever it may be, um, but the approach this year is we're going to bulk up and get bigger and make it more difficult for people to get biased, to, to be able to physically get biased at all. And we're seeing that. And you can say what we talk about them being bigger in the trenches. They are bigger because they are getting bigger bodies as well. Isaiah rakes, and especially the fact he wears the number two. <laughs> It's just massive. Like, look at this photo. Like, <laughs> especially with the number two, it just stands out that much more. But this man is that two what? takes up so much. Not a lot of real estate on the jersey, you know. Like, it's he, just he is what three hundred twenty pounds. I think is what he's listed at. If I if I remember correctly, he's your nose tackle. Okay, last year who was the nose tackle? Who was playing beside Bear Alexander? Not Keon Barr is enough for me. He didn't do anything when he's in there. Uh, <laughs> but he was big. But who was the starter? Stanley Taufu. A converted linebacker who weighs 270 pounds. You are putting 50 pounds more on the line of scrimmage, so there is going to be more heft in the line uh, on the line. And against Colorado, Dejon Benton got all those snaps, and in the second half, he made a nice play one of the times. But they just weren't big down there. It, but that was the idea. Dejon Benton, the reason he was uh, recruited is because he has a quick first step, yeah. and that works at times. You saw when he was able to make impacts at times against certain teams. And then you you don't see him getting any reps against a team like Utah because they just maul you coming off the line. You have to have those bigger bodies. So you, you can complain about us saying that we see things players getting bigger. We would see players getting bigger, but it would be your outside linebacker who's dropping into coverage. Yeah. Um, and then also we also complained a ton last year when we saw your outside linebackers, edge guys like Anthony Lucas not gaining weight but losing weight and Corey, Corey Foreman, Foreman losing weight. And just kind of baffled by what exactly is the idea there, what's going on. But it's not just the, the trenches. And it's important. they got to get bigger in the trenches. And I think Lincoln Riley said that they've gained 340 pounds in the, on the defensive mm -hmm. line, I think is the way he it said it. It was like 20 pounds average per person or something. Now, I, don't, I would like to see that broken down to – verify that because then Braylon Shelby said that much weight for the whole defense yeah and, and so like so, someone's something's not adding up and maybe he's maybe Lincoln Riley's meaning we're 340 pounds heavier and he's saying okay Isaiah rakes for a Stanley title that's plus 50 yeah. I, I don't know <laughs> I don't know exactly that's why I would I would love to see it kind of broken down to understand that a little bit more he gave that quote we'll leave that to him but I shook hands with Eric Gentry Eric Gentry we all know needs to add more weight right he added weight last year he has, a, he has trouble maintaining that weight in the season because of how much he goes side to side when he's playing injury last year. But I could just, in his handshake, I could feel the difference. And seeing his shoulders, I could see that he is getting, at, at minimum in just his shoulders, he's gained five pounds. Like it's just a thicker thing, and that should help him hopefully stay healthier as the season goes on because especially with those long arms, it's 
pectoral pulls and stuff when he's reaching out with one arm or it's you know t- absorbing contact you know having shoulder injuries that's always a concern when you have skinnier linebackers uh like john houston that was always a concern but thicker in those areas so he should be able to absorb a little bit more contact and hopefully he can stay healthy but you can just visibly see someone like him who is not on the line of scrimmage is also bigger and so you know those stand out to me and then seeing some of the freshmen who their first time in a weight room like have gone to work elijah newby um and like i said cameron fountain seeing him in, in high school desmond stevens for me desmond stevens like desmond stevens was listed as a wide receiver in our in our database last year then he got changed to an athlete and that's where he finished at but he is definitely a linebacker he's got a, you know a thick barrel chest and everything so impressive they got a lot of work to do they got to put in a whole new defense all those things but visibly it was impressive uh and we got to give him credit for for that so I, I know we we say we see certain players and a lot of times we like to cherry pick the guys and give them the credit you know in the off season like this guy looks a lot bigger and we may be looking at it and going He's one of ten guys that looks bigger out of a whole roster, um, and, but this it feels like the entire roster. It, there's there's been gr- gains across. It does look like a philo- philosophical change into the way they attack the weight room this off season. Yeah, Andrew in the chat said you guys also said in all caps by the way. So he's yelling at us. You guys also said Corey Foreman looked different. He did look different. He did. He looks like smaller. Like we didn't. We weren't saying it was a good thing. We were saying he looked different because he looked different because he lost like thirty pounds or whatever. Um, Still not sure about what happened there. I some of the stuff was inexplicable. Like, like, why would that? Why were you like? There were guys that were getting smaller that we thought should have got bigger. So I don't even know if that's uh, coaching staff or individual or if he had tapeworm. Uh, that one was just very strange. Yeah, but anyway, so there's that going on. Um, you know, I thought Miller Moss did a good job. Uh, you know, when he addressed the media, obviously QB one out there. Um, you know, I thought he was he was good. Uh, any, any whatever other players said, anything kind of stand out from you guys uh, from from what we heard, or you know, or we could do players first and do some of the coaching stuff too. The Jamil thing last year about them not being big enough, being the elephant in the room, definitely stood out to me the most. I think out of all the players, but Braylon Shelby talked about how if guys under Benny Wiley weren't gaining weight the punishment was plate pushes which is when you put the 45 pound weight maybe they stack them on the ground you got to push them just an awful form of punishment (laughs) and Braylon Shelby talked about how that was really motivating and guys didn't want to have to do those in front of their whole team and so that really brought everyone together and that's been a big factor in why they've gained a lot of weight so I I wrote a little bit about that this week too pretty good uh, punishment I'd say I I wouldn't want to be doing those so I was about to say have you ever had to do one yeah and I mean look at me I probably got it five yards and got tired so (laughs) Those are those are not fun and good punishment in, in my opinion. Yeah, plus you're strengthening the the, yeah. the shoulders there doing that. Uh, a couple things that stood out: Jacoby Lane's forty, I mean not forty, uh, vertical of I think it was forty eight inches, 40, 48. I think so. It is un, is ridiculous. Um, I've heard some positive things about Elijah Newby. Uh, Jonah Monheim. We haven't talked about him moving the center. Um, yeah, that was obviously huge news. We've told you about that on the Peristyle. So if you remember. You knew that. We've said that that's the likely move that was going to happen, what we had been hearing. It hadn't been confirmed. Lincoln Riley confirmed it on the radio show on Monday, I think it was, and then we talked to Jonah Monheim about it. I thought it was really interesting, that move right there, that he's been working with Brett Nealon. And I see them as very similar players. They're very both very cerebral, very intelligent, bright guys. Um, and Brett was undersized. And so I think he had to make up for that a little bit at times with being smarter and identifying things quicker. So I think it's great that Jonah's been working with him. And it's a challenge for Miller Moss that he's got a brand new center in front of him. But I think those two guys really get along really well and they will work to, together well because you need your centering quarterback to, to have a really good synergy, you know, trying to identify fronts and stuff. So that kind of stood out as well. I like yeah. that combination of those two guys. We did talk about it on our show, Ryan. Just, Shotgun, what are your thoughts on the offensive tackle depth right now? It just seems really thin, and I'm sure they'll add someone in the second portal window, but does that concern you at all, needing to add on the offensive line for the second year in a row in the second portal window? Definitely. Uh, I mean, you you guys kind of say it, it's been said kind of casually in, in our, some of our stories. It's been like thrown out. They'll, they'll probably add somebody in the portal. Like, offensive tackles aren't easy to find yeah. in the portal. You can find someone 
and did not end up being that great. Michael Tarkin was a tackle in the portal, and he struggled last year. Um, just because you get somebody, and he uh, was a starter, you know, and now he started at guard as well at, uh, Florida. At, at Florida. But you get somebody from a power conference, and you say, oh, well, they're a starter there. They'll be good. And it doesn't always translate. Uh, so that is definitely a concern just because one injury, and you may have to shuffle the entire line. And so they really need – those youngsters to take that big step forward. Now you're asking a lot of Elijah page to begin with as a potential starter at left tackle for a brand new quarterback with a brand new center in front of him. So one misidentification and he's on an Island and, or there's a blitzer and two guys are coming from his side. How does he handle it? How does he protect the blind side? Like that's all definitely a concern. So yeah, very, it's a, it's scary. If you're, if you're a quarterback, if you're a USC right now, with the tackle death because you always see offensive linemen go down. You do not have a – you almost never – it's 98%, 99% of the time you're going to lose an offensive lineman for a, st- in, in a stint of time during the season. So you have to have six, seven, eight guys, ideally, a backup tackle, backup guard, and a backup center. Um, and so right now USC, I would not say that they had – they should be confident that they have a backup tackle. Now I'm curious to see what Tobias Raymond looks like. He's huge right now, especially compared to where he was when we saw him in high school. Um, but that doesn't mean you block well just because you've got you've gained a lot of weight. So uh, I'm curious to see some of those youngsters and you know if any of them are ready to not start but be able to fill in. Someone goes down in a game, can someone fill in and not have the situation that they had at the end of the year against UCLA? When uh, was it Mason Murphy went down in the game and Alani Noah had to come in, and guess who he got to face? <laughs> Latu Latu Leatu uh, Latu, and he destroyed him repeatedly, and that destroyed USC's you know offensive attack for a good stretch. Mason Murphy eventually comes back in, uh, banged up, and it doesn't get much better for USC. Um, so, like that that's the thing that, that really scares you, with, especially with the uh, the offensive tackle depth right now. It looks like they're just going to have to rely on a lot of redshirt freshmen to be in that rotation. Maybe they won't have to rely on them first four weeks of the season, but someone goes down, and then all of a sudden someone's thrust into that role. I thought Chris had an interesting note about Amos Talalele potentially starting at, at right guard, taking some first-team reps there. So maybe he's a piece of the puzzle too. I think the the biggest thing that could boost them is if Mason Murphy shows that he can yep. be a tackle. If he, if he wins that job. Yeah, and, and shows that he can be consistent there because we've seen flashes from him. He's got the athleticism, um, but we've also seen him struggle. And his his season last year reminded me of Jonah Monheim in 21, I want to say it was, when he – or tw- yeah, 21, when they were terrible. But he started the season at guard uh, or – guard or tackle, I can't remember, and then Jalen McKenzie took over the job, and it was kind of back and forth. He switched at one point. Um, that's what Mason Murphy season last year. What is what has Jonah Monahan done since then? Become like an All-American? Can Mason Murphy take that big step forward? That's going to be the question. Yeah. Uh, all right. Any other kind of spring football sort of news and notes you guys want to mention? Like I said, there's only been three practices. Um, it was good to you know hear from some of the coaches and uh, kind of get some updates on you know where everything is going. We'll be back out there. Is it is Tuesday morning the five thirty one? Yes, it is. So we're going to be a five thirty a.m. practice on Tuesday. After so the women of Troy play Monday night at seven, baby. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> we'll get we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, that'll be funny. Like so, uh, you I'll stay be a over, zombie. Just stay overnight there, I guess. And uh, want to camp out? Room in the USC hotel. <laughs> no, no, you get. A tent. I do not want to do <laughs> that. A tent on campus. Yeah, oh, I get you. No, I get go. you a tent. Yeah. <laughs> Like under the freeway pass, there. I see a lot of tents. Yeah, you can, yeah. I'll Thanks. get you one. Uh, one, one, one more right thing. One more thing that stood out to me from what people saying was uh, Braylon Shelby talking about they're going, they're going to cause havoc. They're going oh, yeah. to cause different approach. chaos. Um, and like, it didn't sound like that's our goal. It sounded like it's an imperative. It is a that was a, de- uh, a declarative sentence that we're going to cause chaos. Okay, all right, we'll see it. We'll see if they actually can do that because, you know, Lincoln Riley had some nice quotes about the defense going into the last season too, and it didn't work out. Yeah, that's so. something we'll need to see. But you're right. Talked about toughness and being physical and wanting to be violent and being the ones who uh, cause that havoc. Like, 
last year it seemed like other defenses kind of punched USC in the mouth, and yeah. they want to be the ones to do the punching. You want to be the hammer, not the nail. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, but got to see that. I think USC was like they were trying to be – the spectacular play defense, like get the sack, get the turnover. Have the perfect play call. Yeah, that kind of stuff as opposed to just like messing up what the other team is doing, you know, and just like go like creating havoc where, like Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan to get punched in the mouth. And so you do the punching. And then, if you know, you see that when uh, the, the Chiefs play, like they're trying to take a shot at them. And Patrick Mahomes is amazing and he can still come back and, and make a huge play. But not everyone can do that. So you you punch them in the mouth a couple of times, and they might not make the play that they had planned. Instead of like kind of letting them do whatever they want and trying to out execute them or whatever. So I think the havoc creation is a, is a good plan. Uh, I we didn't even give it full justice. Here's the the quote. Uh, okay. He said, "We're gonna go out there and we're gonna mess someone up. <laughs> we're gonna go out there and we're gonna wreak, uh, wreck havoc. We're gonna go. We're going to cause a scene." <laughs> We're gonna call it a car accident. Yeah, crazy. They violent. That's that's the word I keep coming yeah. back to. So I like that. That that was that quote stood out to me for sure. Um, and you know, so, so much going on this week. Pro day was this week too. Oh yeah. Caleb Williams uh, threw and looked fine. Um, he's gonna be the number one pick. The Browns. Ha- I mean, not the Browns. The Bears. <laughs> the Bears the, were there. The Browns. That's what that, f- six years ago. That was uh, Sam Darnold. Yeah. yeah. The, the Bears had, like, 94 people here. They were out a day early to come, probably do some extra reconnaissance uh, on him. But, you know. Cotter did, like, 15 Bears podcasts. So you <laughs> It know was crazy. I, I posted one clip of him throwing. Hey, can you come on tonight? Hey, can you come on tonight? <laughs> oh, sure. I, I, I don't know how much I can give you, but sure. He, he looked good throwing the ball. No, they asked a lot of – everyone wants to know about the, the off-the-field stuff. Is it true? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's all way blown out of proportion. Uh, I'm glad those questions are over. I'm excited for the draft, him to be one and done, or not one and done, first overall pick, and then we can we can move on. What a, what a, I feel bad for those number one picks. They get a lot of money. It works out for them, but the pressure, the scrutiny, the rumors, oh, yeah. you got to have thick skin, and sometimes forget thick skin. It's just blatantly wrong stuff thrown out about you, and I don't know if thick skin helps you get by that. you gotta, you got to go out and set the record straight. Uh, and – Caleb's never really done that. He's yeah. never, but, but like, there's been so many just random things. Like, he he wants ownership. Uh, he wants part ownership of a team. It's like, okay, he's not gonna <laughs> get it. Like, hey, he's never said this on the record. Like, these things that people like d- have taken these stories and just run with. Like, mm-hmm. he, this, this is why he's a bad person because he wants this. I can't stand him because I've had multiple people in New Jersey um, tell me I can't stand him because. And they'll use one of those type of stories. I'm like, that's not true. I'm like, did you? He never actually said that. And, and, and did uh, his team maybe talk about it internally as the number one generational player? Like, hey, player empowerment. Maybe this is something we could ask for. Sure, but did they act maybe, on that? Maybe. Did they ever go out and say, hey, Chicago Bears, I'm not going to you unless you make me a 15 percent <laughs> stakeholder. No. So since when is it the end of the world to have a conversation about something behind closed doors when you're so talented? That's what's really bothered me about this whole thing because he the, the narrative just gets way out of control. Yeah. It, it, it's one thing to behind closed doors say, hey, I'm probably going to be number one. Is this something we consider? Okay. And then they decide not to. And then it's a huge story that they even talked about it. If I think something and I don't do anything after thinking it, is that a big story? If I yeah. just thought about something? I don't yes, so. you're a terrible person. The, <laughs> I mean, the big issue is that everyone knew he he was going to be the number one pick last year. You know, he wins the Heisman and they're like, if he came out this year, he would be the number one pick for the 2023 draft. And, um, you know, so for 2024, they've, they've just known that forever. So you have a whole extra year of people just punching holes and, and trying to find flaws. And, and they didn't play very well. And that, Right. A lot of it obviously wasn't his fault, but yeah. that didn't help, of course. But when you're presumed number one, this is what happens. You yeah. get disse- dissected more and more and more. Matt Barkley was in a similar situation. You know, after when he decided to come back for his senior year, everyone kind of presumed he's a first round pick and started dissecting his game more and more and more. And there were more holes in his game than there are Caleb Williams. Um, right. So Caleb Williams, in my opinion, is a generational talent. Um, he's probably the best quarterback since Andrew Luck, in my opinion, coming out. Now, we'll see if that holds up to be true because just because you have an amazing talent doesn't mean you're going to have success in the NFL. It is so much about what is around you, the environment you're in, all those extra things that go into it. 
And even someone like Andrew Luck, who was the best quarterback in at least a decade, um, how much success did he really have? They won a couple of playoff games, didn't win any Super Bowls or anything. His body got destroyed because he didn't have an offensive line. And, you know, if he's put in a great situation with a great offensive line, who knows what records he could have set staying healthy the entire time and, you know, all those different things. Whereas Patrick Mahomes goes to and he ends up with Andy Reid yeah. and Eric Manny and that offense – and they put the pieces around him and have had so much success, and he was able to sit for a year and all those different things. There's been tons of talented p- players, not just quarterbacks, but players that don't s- have success because they aren't in a great situation. So that will definitely play into it. But I still look at him coming out of college and say, he does things that I have not seen any other quarterback do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, if I'm going to be wrong on someone, it's going to be him. That, that's how I look at I'm, it. You can't predict someone's for sure going to be great, but I'm going to take my chance with him. Yeah. I'm very disappointed that the, the Falcons, as a Falcons fan, yeah, sorry. Sorry, man. signed Kirk Cousins and did not go trade up to get Caleb Williams. I was having breakfast <laughs> in Vegas and sitting next to a guy who ended up being like a USC fan and was talking to me. He's like, I don't really like the NFL, but I'm going to be a fan whoever Caleb Williams gets drafted by. I'm like, well, you're probably going to like the Bears because that's where he's going. But, <laughs> um, yeah, so interesting stuff. Okay, yeah, so Pro Day was going on. Connor and I did get to talk about that last week on our Parastel Podcast show. We will put a podcast version of this up as well. So if you're listening on the podcast feed, just know this is our normal our video show. So if you want to go over to YouTube or Facebook or our Twitter account at USC football. Uh, we have the live version of the video up that you can play and replay whatever you want. And if you can like uh, the feed, subscribe to our feeds, like them, like the videos, share them with your friends. We do appreciate all that. Uh, there's some, uh, like shotgun said, extended weekend going on. Uh, Galen center. It's kind of fun. Like for, if you're not as familiar with the women's hoops, cause obviously it's March madness this weekend. They have all those regionals all over the place, you know, different teams travel. I think both Auburn and Alabama were in like Spokane, Washington, like the weird stuff there for the women's group. Then you can host uh, for a weekend, but the other teams will also come. So it's kind of like you're hosting your own little regional there and uh, USC uh, beat, you know, they had a tomato can in the first round because they were a uh, from number one seed, so Texas A&M te- Corpus Christi. Yeah, which is a thing. Apparently, never heard of that. But uh, <laughs> it's just a thing. I guess that's a the thing. The Islanders. Yeah, they they destroyed the Islanders, and then uh, now we got the, so they're number one seed. They face number eight, Kansas. You know, big uh, basketball name. Uh, the women's team, I think, is pretty good. You know, they're an eight seed. They're not you know, super elite, but uh, certainly could be a test. So Monday night at the Galen Center, Juju Watkins setting records all over the place. Uh, she will be going uh, against Kansas. So I know you guys did instant analysis from the game uh, on Saturday. Maybe give your thoughts on on that and then what USC can do uh, on Monday night to make it to the Sweet 16. I think it's a game they should win on their home court against a Kansas team that's good but not great. We saw Michigan Probably should have won the game in the, the first round. They were up by nine points to begin the fourth quarter. Kansas battled back, sent it to overtime, and won in overtime. Kansas is a little taller than Michigan. They have good size. But USC, with that home crowd and just the way that they are playing right now, I, I, I don't think they'll have any big issue and should be on to the Sweet 16. That's what I expect, and that's my prediction. Yeah, uh, Kansas outscored Michigan in the fourth quarter in overtime. I think it was 35-17. to 17. Um, So give them a lot of credit. Now, they have a veteran team. they played together for a long time. Uh, their, their core has. Uh, Tayana Jackson is six foot six. She's long and, and skinny, length and, and height. Um, you know, it's a little bit different player than USC has faced outside of maybe uh, Stanford. Now, USC handled Stanford's height in, in those two matchups, though Cameron Brink and Kiki Iriafin both got theirs in the second game. Uh, so that'll be a little bit of a challenge. She's a shot blocker down low, too, so we'll see how much of an impact she can have on the defensive end. And then they have two guards that have been around for, for six years. So they're experienced. They're not going to be, you know, they're not going to be phased by the environment of the Galen Center. Uh, but Zakiah Franklin, she's the one that hit the three, the tie the game, I believe, um, to send the game to overtime with about, I think she hit a three with about 12 seconds left when they were down. And then also... Uh, Holly Kurt Kurt Skyder, uh, who can knock down threes as well. So those two will should be able to handle the pressure. 
can USC get them sped up will be interesting. You know, it's hard to do that with, with veteran guards, but can USC kind of control the pace of the game? I think is something I want to see from them. And if they can do that, then, you know, I, I think that Lindsey Gottlieb and crew will have a, a game plan ready to go against the Jayhawks. And they're very beatable. We saw Michigan. Michigan dominated down low with some bigger bodies. USC doesn't have the same style of, of uh, player as far as just – Michigan had some thicker low post players. They were able to use their weight to push around uh, Tayana Jackson because, she, like I said, she's skinny. Um, so, you know, how is USC kind of attacked? That'll be interesting to see. But what about the atmosphere at the Galen Series? It was terrific. Uh, la- uh, was that last night? It seems so long ago. Two nights ago. Was it? No, that was, no, no, that was last, last, yesterday see, afternoon. Yeah, that seems so long ago. Uh, we've done, been doing so much things. There's been so many commits at USC. Um, <laughs> But yesterday, the atmosphere was terrific. Uh, now, it was not sold out, but it was, it, was a, close. it was a great atmosphere. There's some areas. I mean, there's tickets still available, guys. Make sure you get there tomorrow. should be a really fun game. But I love the fact that the crowd was into it. That, that's great. But it wasn't like it was all bandwagon fans. Fans are just like, oh, they made the NCAA tournament, and it's at, at USC. I might as well go to that. Tickets are pretty cheap. Fifteen bucks, guys. Get your ticket. Um, even for lower bowl, there were some of them were fifteen dollars. Um, but they were fans that were knowledgeable enough to know. Walk on India Auto is at the end of the bench, and with about four minutes left, you start hearing Auto, Auto. Chance to try to get the the walk on in. Fifth year senior, she comes in and has you know what she calls what she said will be a core memory for her, and she makes a layup, her first two point bucket in her career. Um, that she's made. So she makes a layup. The entire bench is going crazy. Oh, this is great. They're like mimicking the play on the bench. Comes down the next possession. She drains a three. Career high five points for her. The place goes, the, the entire Galen Center goes crazy. For, crazier for a walk-on's bucket than anything Juju Watkins did in that game. And Juju was, was uh, terrific once again. So was McKenzie Ford. Both of them had 23 points on pretty efficient shooting combined, the two of them. Uh, but Indiano makes, uh, you know, scores the last five points for USC, and the place was going wild. And she got to go into the press conference. That was really cool. I just thought it was a really cool uh, moment and memory for her. She talked about how she had she had literal goosebumps after she hit the three, and she's going back down the court. And to see her teammates, almost almost fully tackle her, <laughs> like you know, Coach Henny would have been, you know, uh, would have would have approved by Juju Not Watkins' uh, form. <laughs> Uh, attacking any auto after the the final horn uh, the sounded, but it was really cool to see that moment and everything. Uh, got some great photos that should be coming up. You know, as soon as we get done with this, I will be posting them of the entire uh, game and whatnot. A lot of photos, but it was really fun atmosphere, and we'll see if uh, you know the the Galen Center crowd can come back out tomorrow night. It is a week night. It is. You know, you got to drive through traffic. You know what? Get off work early and come at three, and come <laughs> have tailgate. Know, have Hang a, out with me yeah, at Chipotle. Tell, yeah, there we I go. Get, my, get my pregame Chipotle. <laughs> come say hello. Or stop by the lab or whatever in McKay's. You know, get you something to drink. Come in. Be rowdy. You know, have a great time and you know, see what the women of Troy can do because they're planning to go to the Sweet 16. They won against a 16 seed. They're supposed to do that, right? It's the first NCAA tournament win for this program since 2006. Wow. That's a long time, guys. That's a long time. We had uh, Lindsey Gottlieb on, of course, the you know head coach for the women of Troy there, and uh, when she first got hired, and you know coming from the NBA, the not the WNBA, the NBA, uh, you know impressive resume. It just looked like she was someone that was going to come in and get the job done, and then to get you know a recruit like Juju Watkins, some of the transfers that they've got in, have the success they've had, beating Stanford like they have, getting a number one seed, like this is sort of like ahead of schedule stuff. Um, and then, you know, the recruiting class that they have coming in women's basketball is, is really big right now. It's grown a lot. Um, I was never big, like kind of WNBA fan. I think it's a lot more entertaining at the college level, like you know, women's college game. And there's a, I mean, you're seeing, you know, Caitlin Clark is the biggest star in college basketball, not you know, not for men's or women, like for both. Like she's the biggest name and Juju Watkins has the potential to be something like that. So to see what Lindsay Gottlieb has been able to do, uh, and it's great that fans are, are showing up and, and checking it out. We've had a lot of good coverage. Ahmad's been doing a great job. And, you know, the fact that you guys were both out there, that's awesome. So hopefully USC fans, if you like football, um, 
they're they're fun. And uh this is you know, I think Lindsey Golov is building something. You know, you want to get to be like what Tennessee had or what UConn had, you know, South Carolina, LSU, like teams right now. You want to be in that kind of upper echelon of women's college basketball. And I know a lot of fans really wanted to see USC have a great softball team and there's all the talent out here, but I think you can do the same kind of stuff in the basketball side. So it's it's pretty impressive what she's done so far and what they're building on. And and you know, really curious to see what kind of run they make, you know, this year. If they can make a final four run or something. I mean, that'd be pretty special. And you get all the comparisons to Cheryl Miller and all that kind of stuff. So when I was a freshman, you know, uh, Lisa Leslie was uh, the big recruit. She scored like a hundred points in a high school game and stuff. Obviously, she's a legend. But in the um, first half, mm-hmm. in the, they yeah, they canceled the second half. <laughs> second half. Uh, but this is cool stuff. So if, if you we, know, we if didn't you like, mention what Juju did. She set the record, right? Yeah, breaking Cheryl Miller's single season scoring record, and we talked about it on Instant Analysis. If USC plays three more games, there's a chance she breaks the all time freshman scoring record in the NCAA. women's basketball history. So. If you don't know Juju Watkins, definitely check her out. She is a special, special talent, and I wrote about her backing up the generational talent tag after the opening round win. She has something up her sleeve every night. Really, really impressive player, and I'm sure on Monday night tomorrow she'll she'll do something special again. Really excited for the game. It's great. I, she carries herself well. Shotgun oh, yeah. and I got to – well, Shotgun interviewed her. I was filming uh, when we were in Las Vegas for the opener when they beat – Ohio State, so uh, that was pretty cool. But, yeah, so definitely someone you could root for if you're a USC fan. All right, we can do, let's do some questions. So, again, I didn't get to star the questions for YouTube. Did you pull up any shotgun? I think I have some from Facebook I can pull up, too. But if you're – well, I'll, I'll look through some of the chat and see. But I thought this was a pretty interesting one. TC asked, uh, is there anything we can learn about the defense from the skill set of this weekend's recruits? I heard Coach Lynn say how much he values versatility. What do these young guys offer there? Um, I think when you're getting five-star defensive linemen, you know, they have two things, size and quickness. You know, that's how you become a five-star defensive lineman. So I I think that there's some versatility there with Justice Terry um, and Isaiah Gibson about where you can move them on the line. So I I think that's just natural ability, though, and how their bodies are going to kind of morph as they continue to grow. Um, so that's one of the things that definitely stands out is that the defensive line, they're, you're stacking pieces that allow you to try out different things and move guys around a little bit versus saying last year for USC in particular, Barry Alexander has to play on the nose because we have no one else that can take up size and can you know be a force inside with them. But if you get more multiple, multiple players, and this year Isaiah Rakes, could potentially help unlock what uh, Bear Alexander can do just because he can occupy blockers, he can take on a double team, he can do those different things to possibly open up Bear Alexander a little bit more. Yeah, I don't know if I have any big scheme takeaways from the commitments, but I just wonder if Danton Lynn at all has said, hey, look at the front I had last year at UCLA. We can do something like this with you guys on board, and that's probably very appealing to a lot of these guys as well. So the, the staff is always going to match – the, what, what the talent, the roster to for, for what they want to do scheme wise. So I, I think right now, it's too early to say. Oh, Justice Terry, he's going to play this specific role. His body will change. The USC staff might change. A lot can change in the time it will take for him to put on a USC uniform. But I, I think the versatility, like Shotgun said, is important. And Danton Lynn having that experience last year, having an awesome front at UCLA, I'm sure that helped. Yeah, we had one uh, Facebook question from Bo. Um, how do we go from Division One athletes can't have a job and earn money to these collectives paying kids to go to schools? Why can't these kids just have the availability to go and get work on their own? Well, that's essentially what they're doing. I mean, they're getting – it's like they're getting – this is their work. Is that You're basically – you're a college football athlete, and there are people willing to pay you to be that. So – this isn't like they have to go work at the corner store. They're working at, you know, it's everyone would say it's like a full-time job when you're a college athlete. Well, now they're getting money for that. So they they are putting in a lot of work. They're going, you know, 20 hours a week for whatever and in, in the film study and everything that they're doing. And now they're signing contracts and they're doing stuff for it too. Like, you know, we've had uh, house of victory athletes come on our show they get paid for their appearances by House of Victory or if they go to like a Boys and Girls Club and 
uh, go visit, the, you know, help kids out, whatever they want to do. So it's essentially what they're doing is like now they're getting paid. There's also the side of like, hey, you want to be on, we're seeing a lot of commercials where there's athletes on during March Madness. Um, they're getting paid like a regular athlete would where before they weren't allowed to do that. But the the maybe the unintended consequences or whatever from NIL opening things up is you basically can't get paid to be a college athlete, which we you couldn't get before. Yeah, I think uh, Juju's in an AT and T commercial. I don't know if you noticed. Yeah, that, one of those. Is the question pretty much just why are they getting paid? Because they have a tremendous market. That that's why they have value. People want them at their school because they're talented players, and it's very similar to professional sports, even though there are some differences. I I, I think and maybe Bo, I'm not be reading into this, but. I feel like the people feel like, well, how did we go so far so fast? I think it was repressed for so long. When you have, uh, who was the the Colorado uh, skier that could? Um, I'm blanking on his name. I'm thinking, I, I mean, the same thing earlier. He's a college athlete, and you're like, oh, you can't make money on endorsements as a Olympic skier representing your country because you play Colorado football, like stuff like that, or. You were a lacrosse player, and no, you can't go back to your hometown and hold a camp and charge ten dollars a head for the kids to like learn from you because that would be making money off of your college sport or having a YouTube video trick shot. I mean, who was the? I forget there was a long snapper for USC that was doing trick shot videos, you know, snapping it through a, a moving car window as it would go by, and he couldn't monetize his YouTube videos. David Johnson. It might have been. Um, Jeremy Bloom was a skier. Jeremy Bloom, yes. Um, so that kind of stuff was going on. You, they, they held. That was way too far. Once they opened up the floodgates and they didn't know what to do because of the state laws, and it started with California. I think Florida pushed theirs up ahead. Then the NCAA was sort of caught with their pants down, and they were just like, "Okay, well, don't do paper play or uh, anything like that." They just didn't know what to do, and it was just going to be out of control. I think they could have had this happen where, hey, you can make money off your own image, your YouTube page or your Instagram or whatever. But they were just, they were like, no, 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 forever. And then once the, the laws finally said, you can't do this, it just opened everything up. And I think that's why, Bo, we went from, you can't do anything to, you can't even get a job to now you can get paid for all this stuff. Yeah, crack turned into a crevice, turned into the floodgates busting through. So. Yeah. That's how you've gone from one one side to the other. Um, I mean, ideally, players throughout the entire thing would have been able to make money off their name, image, likeness. But now they're making money in pay for play away and everything else. So that's why the game is is going in a drastic different way um, because the NCAA didn't find that figure a way out earlier for them to actually earn money off of you know things outside of their actual sport and whatnot. Um, you know. We are, we are, we are. Real quick, while we're on NIL, I heard some. I won't get too deep into it, but it was a good weekend for USC's NIL setup. Good things are happening. Uh, well, along those lines, Moises says, uh, "Do you believe USC is figuring out uh, NIL? It appears getting these players out of Georgia, like that, could be a part of it." I, but I think it's definitely trending that way. This weekend was huge. If Julian Lewis leaves town next weekend and. Maybe it'll take a while for him to publicly say so. But if USC holds on to his commitment, that to me is sort of the barometer of, of the, the NIL setup right now because I think it, it's not just him. If you can get really good offensive linemen and a complete class around him, he, he knows he's wherever he goes, people will follow. But USC, they just need to build a complete class around him to keep his commitment solid. And that to me screams if they do, the NIL is there. If they don't, they have some work to do. I think this weekend was huge for USC. It's trending in the right direction, but we just need to see what happens with Julian Lewis. That's the barometer for me. All right. I like that one. Sean uh, on Facebook says, did uh, Lincoln give the quarterback coaching job away? Or I guess, you know, because Luke Heward's taking that over because Miller Moss is not his man. I think someone else. Yeah. Like in their relationship type of thing or like. (laughs) I don't think not that's, my man's. I don't think that's, that's what he not means. my man's. Uh, Andrew had a similar question. He said, not exactly similar, but another QB question. He said, do you guys think the QB room takes a major step back now that Lincoln is more hands-off from the QB meetings? I would say Lincoln, the reason why he's taking his hands off is because their defense was awful last year, yeah. and he's trying to be 
more involved in the defense, even though he said he was going to be last year, we're seeing him take more defense first. It's kind of been his mantra this the whole offseason. You know, as soon as they uh, hired Denton Landings, talk about, hey, we're going to be – it's going to be defense forward. And so I think he's doing that. And we'll see if that continues. And if the quarterback starts slipping and there's a step back – now, there's going to be a step back because you don't have Caleb Williams. But if there's a step back uh, in the overall quarterback play – I think Lincoln Riley would probably just, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back in this meeting room real quick. I, w- yeah, I, I wonder if Will Howard's here or Miller Moss transfers and Jade Maeva is a starter, is, is Lincoln Riley leaving the, the quarterback room like this? I think because Miller's been there for two years, even though he is going to be new, that's really big. And if they had a new guy in place, then it's, okay, every day got to be in here and the quarterback's the most important position. This guy's new. He's got to learn our offense. I think the fact that Miller has a lot of experience is significant, and I don't know if Lincoln makes this move if – Miller hasn't had two years in his system yeah. already. So in I other words, say, it's because he is his man. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I wouldn't say he's hands off. Like, he's going to be in other meeting rooms, which is good, but it's, he's not avoiding the quarterback. He still will be a part of that, you know. And um, when we were asking him about it, it was just sort of like this reluctance to, like, you know, he didn't really want to give it away, but, you know, he's doing it for the betterment of the team. But it's, I don't think he's not going to be involved at all, so – uh, but yeah, having someone like Luke Heward, like obviously a lot of, you know, quarterback knowledge in that family. And uh, it seems like Miller Moss has a good relationship with him. So that's good. Any other ones on YouTube that you saw, Shotgun? Eric, want to know, do you think we can realistically keep these commitments all the way to signing day? What's the chance in your estimate? I will bet that they will lose a commitment before signing day. I'm not saying it's one of these guys, but they'll lose somebody. Yeah, that, 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 that just happens. happens. Yeah. I, I think Justice Terry is so tied into Eric Henderson that even though he's in Georgia and he was committed to Georgia, is there a chance he flips back to Georgia? Sure. But to me, it, he just looks like an Eric Henderson guy through and through based on what his dad said, based on having Eric Henderson narrate his freaking commitment video. Those guys seem really in, in lockstep. And as long as Eric Henderson's here, I feel like, Justice Terry will be here. We haven't really heard from Isaiah Gibson since he committed. I don't think any of the major recruiting sites have gotten an interview with him, so it's tough to exactly read his situation right now just because I haven't heard from him. But with Terry, I think it's all about Eric Henderson. Uh, Lloyd, want to know, do you think Lincoln will have any interest in Kyle Ford? He's in the transfer portal again. Oh, he is. Interesting. Where do you stand on a guy leaves and then welcoming him back? I feel like once you're gone, you're gone. Uh, Depends on the situation. I I don't want to give a, you know, a yeah, end all be statement. all blanket but i think with the situation it, usc's depth issues they have a wide receiver it wouldn't be a bad move in my opinion yeah if he's up to that because i don't know if he the reason why he left is because he wanted more, more playing time yeah. more balls thrown his way and he knew how crowded the usc the idea would be hey you know the system you're not going to be a starter we've already got these young bucks that are, are going to be our guys but we need more depth, and you can you already know the offense. We can trust you, so if someone goes down, we can throw you in there. So is that of interest to Kyle Ford? I don't know. It's less crowded, though, than when he left. It's less crowded. They're going to be pursuing a big-time receiver in the portal, though, in the spring. In, in but but they need more than one. No, no, I, I, I'm just – like, I, I think it's going to get more crowded. That's all I'm going to yeah. say. Uh, but, but he has a great rapport with Miller Moss, too. So, uh, like, there's things that could make it a harmonious connection. But that, again, I think it all comes back to, like, is Kyle, would Kyle Ford be interested in that? Where's his mind at right now as far as the transfer portal well, and what, what he's looking for? Would USC be interested, too, I wonder? I think USC would just because it's some someone you can trust. Like, I don't think you look at it and you go, it's the boomer bust potential of Dorian Singer. Like, with Dorian Singer, he had this great year and then did nothing at USC. You know what Kyle Ford's going to give you. He's going to give you consistency. And when he had his opportunities at USC, he provided catches oh, yeah. and stuff. So, you know, he's consistent. He already knows the offense. I mean, he had to relearn some things or whatever. But, like, I I think that that USC, as long as there's not any burned bridges behind doors, then I I think that that would be something that USC, um, if if there are still depth issues – because there are wide rec- a lot of wide receivers in the transfer portal. If they if there's not guys that they are really coveting above, and you know if there's a spot like that's I I could see that easily working. And Lincoln Riley's not a Dabo Swinney where if you transfer out of yeah, Clemson, yeah. you are not coming back here under no circumstances. Like they had John Jackson back at pro day. They yeah. guys who leave the they they bring them back a lot of the time with, with open arms. There's no ill will, and I think that's part of being like a new yeah. age coach. Yeah, John so, Jackson, John Jackson, and the. I'm blanking on the name, the uh, walk-on uh, offensive lineman. Yep. So it's not like 
Uh, you know, it's like, you left our program. You can't be here anymore. And look at the reception that Kyle Ford got after the USC UCLA game. USC got their, their butts handed to him, but there were still several of his teammates that came up. He's still well liked by his team, by his former teammates at USC. So um, it, it will, it'll all depend on what each side really wants. Deep down, though, something about joining the rival, does that, I mean, we're talking about all the positives. You're welcome back. Does that irk you at all? No. Your defense coordinator is from your rival. Your well, coaches, it's your a starting players, players. Your starting cornerback is from your, the rival. Your starting safety is from the rival. Hey, so, I hear you. Man. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I just think they that probably used to mean a little more, and now I guess it doesn't. Yeah, especially it's, this it's era. It's a different era. Yeah. yeah. It's a very different era. Yeah. All right. Well, should we wrap it up? Do you, you, you have any more that you wanted to do? We uh, could... I didn't have any spotlighted necessarily. Um, yeah. Someone asked, can, can Caleb introduce Juju Lewis to his NIL context at Beats? Um, I saw someone say that you know, Juju already's got a bunch of NIL deals and stuff, so we'll see about that. Yeah, apparently Georgia changed the law, right? That well, does he does he have the same agent as Lincoln Riley, right, or the same representation? Uh, I don't get into all that, but uh, I should, probably should, to be honest. Yeah, I think I think he does. So he's gonna have plenty. If he doesn't have <laughs> Caleb Williams beats guy yet, it'll have him next week. It's gonna happen. Yeah. Well, it's good stuff, everybody. We wanted to do a show because Shotgun's in town. We have uh, spring ball the next four weeks. So we'll try to do these Tunnel Vision shows, uh, you know, the end of the weekend on Sunday nights, kind of recapping uh, what's going on. We will do uh, take live calls again. It just There was a few technical things. I, I mean, I really got this working yeah, right. Jo- right at the de- uh, I got it second. working at the deadline, so I could, didn't have time to set up the live calls. Uh, but There's we'll, been so much going on. We yeah. finally had to put Ryan to work this weekend <laughs> since he's been off playing. I was Vegas. like gone. I was like, okay, what's going on here? Um, I, I actually recorded a podcast on my drive to Vegas on Thursday. So I kind of bookend wow. my little Vegas trip with uh, <laughs> but it was the Pac-12 podcast and stuff. It was fun. Um, yeah, so we'll keep doing these. Uh, check out our YouTube channel uh, over we, you know, our Facebook page too. We'll be broadcasting live there. And uh, if you want to follow uh, at USC Football or any one of us, uh, on Twitter, you can follow us there, and uh, we'll get all the live streams and stuff. And like right. I said, go to USCFootball.com, 50% right. off. Yeah, right now we have a 50% off, uh, so make sure you get in there, subscribe to get the latest on all the information that's coming out. Who knows? By this time tomorrow, there might be three more commitments. Uh, you know, it was a huge weekend for USC. And by this time tomorrow, we'll see what the score of the game is because we'll be just uh, coming out to uh, begin second half or you know early in the second half of the USC women's game. Should be really fun. If you can't make it to Galen Center, fine. Watch it on ESPN. But if you get a chance to, come out to Galen Center. It should be really exciting. How often do you get to support your team on your on your home turf in the NCAA tournament? Yeah. There's there's only a couple sports that, that do it. So, you know, it, you, USC's never going to play in the Coliseum in the college football. Well, I'll take that back. They could play in the college football <laughs> playoff. They never could before. Um, so, you know, and we'll see if they can in the future if they start playing a little bit better. But the women are playing in the Galen Center, and it's an opportunity for them to go to the Sweet 16 first time in ages that they would have done that. So get out and support them. Sounds good. All right. Well, great stuff, guys. Uh, I'm glad we did this. And, uh, yeah, crazy, crazy couple days around USC football and USC athletics. And then tomorrow be – could be nuttier too, and Gerard and Chris will have a more in-depth recruiting podcast uh, we tomorrow will, night. We will also be recording a Helium Boys podcast tomorrow, so you can go ahead and get your questions in for that. Uh, I will put out a tweet in just a second, but you guys can send us questions for that. Chris and I will be in the studio early in the morning just to get the day started. We want to go ahead and record a podcast in the morning because... I'm out here. Might as well record something. That sounds good. <laughs> All right. Uh, Harvey Hyde and I might do a podcast tomorrow, but we might not if you guys are doing Healing Boys in the morning. So I'll, I'll, I'll check on him with that. But uh, that'll wrap things up for Mr. Triple Double Connor Morissette. Uh, Shotgun Spratling. I am Ryan Abraham. Hope you guys enjoyed the show, and we will talk to you next time.